Okay, go ahead. This is December, Christmas season in Tokyo. And we're here right in front of the Emperor's Palace in Tokyo. I'd like to do an update on a trip I just made through Southeast Asia, particularly how it pertains to the depleted uranium issue. And I attended as a guest speaker the War Crimes Conference held by Toon Dr. Mahathir in Kuala Lumpur at the end of October 2009. And then we convened a war crimes tribunal to try former President George W. Bush, uh, former Prime Minister Tony Blair of England, and former uh, Prime Minister Howard of Australia for war crimes in Iraq uh, caused during the 2003 Iraq War. Now, Toon Dr. Mahathir has invited, uh, or when he was Prime Minister, he invited uh, many Iraqi refugees or displaced people, really, internally displaced people, to come to Malaysia and make it their new home. Now, they are very educated Iraqis, they have their families with them, and they're able, fortunately, to work in hospitals as medical doctors, in universities as professors, and uh, perhaps some of them are even in government jobs in Malaysia. This is quite different from the way uh, Iraqi refugees are living in Syria and Jordan and other countries that have taken them in as refugees. They're living in utter poverty with uh, almost no rights because they're not citizens of those countries. They're tolerated, but they're really not treated very well. Um, and of course, when they live in Jordan and in Syria, they can go in and out of Iraq and uh, visit families and so forth. But um, they're not able to educate their uh, children, and um, they, they're just struggling to survive and to stay alive. So um, Dr. Mahathir is really the first a Muslim leader and the first world leader who has been willing to help the Palestinians and the Iraqis. Um, at this conference for the first time, many of the Malaysian Iraqi community attended the War Crimes Conference and when Dr. Mahathir has a War Crimes Conference, um, 5,000 people come. So it's not a small effort, it's a very expensive undertaking, and he has a very nice exhibit hall uh, recreating war, war crimes from uh, different uh, war scenes, Vietnam, Palestine, Iraq, um, and other countries, to educate people about uh, why we need to criminalize war. And I think he's a very, very wonderful uh, human being, humanitarian. If anyone deserved the Nobel Peace Prize, it's him. But since some of the Nobel Peace Prize winners are really war criminals, I think that um, Dr. Mahathir might hesitate to accept it. So uh, at that conference, I presented new data from very new research published in 2009 in the spring and summer. And what is happening is the global pollution with low-level radiation from depleted uranium weapons. It's carried on air currents and in atmospheric dust and then rained out into the oceans. Uh, the fishing catch has been impacted. It's dropped 40% in the last 10 years. Um, and this also happened during nuclear bomb testing. As soon as the bomb testing ended in 1963, the fishing catch, which had declined 50% in the North Atlantic, over-recovered in five years. So what we know is that as soon as we turn off the radioactive pollution, life can go on and reproduction can go on and it's uh, the only solution to radioactive weapons and radioactive pollution and that includes nuclear power plants as well. So the new evidence 
that is being published is that in fish populations all over the United States, there is intersex identified in the testes or the sperm producing tissue of the fish. And in all the fish populations that were tested by the United States Geological Survey, there were female immature egg uh, cells in the tissue that was also producing sperm. And this is called intersex. It's where the external and internal expression of sex is not compatible. Now, I also discovered that a gold medal runner from South Africa uh, was um, tested, sex tested, gender tested in September of 2009 because she was winning all her races and people said, well, maybe she's really a man. And what they discovered when they tested her was her testosterone levels were higher than normal for a woman, but they were not out of range for a woman. When they investigated her internally, she had no uterus, no ovaries, but she had testes, pro, um, uh, sperm producing organs. And so the Olympic Committee allowed her to keep her gold medals, but in future competitions she would have to compete with the men. Now, what's interesting about the Olympic Committee is that gender testing was mandatory until 1999, 98 or 99. And they stopped then because what they were having to deal with is that the chromosomes in women were abnormal. And, um, and so um, there was, uh, it was difficult to test women who had abnormal chromosomes and it was increasing. Uh, so they just dropped the gender test, but they did test this runner uh, in September. Now, other expressions of uh, the hormone and estrogen disruptor effects of uranium are also being expressed both in wildlife and in human populations. And we know that polar bears in the Arctic, female polar bears now, are giving uh, birth to cubs, polar bear cubs, but they also have uh, male genitalia um, on their bodies as well as female organs. So this is another example of uh, intersex or uh, hermaphrodite, or uh, there are many terms for it, but basically it's mixed gender in the same organism, and that is not normal. That is from the estrogen disruption effects of uranium. And I now have uh, professional air, air flow charts uh, made by a British military, uh, British Navy intelligence officer who is also a meteorologist and uh, also worked at NATO headquarters. And he made charts for me at uh, of the airflow on particular days at low, medium, and high altitude. And really, you can see how these air masses are carrying the uh, radioactive depleted uranium dust and gas all over Europe, all over the Arctic, all over China and Russia and Southeast Asia, and of course around the world. And in 2007, there was very, very, very heavy bombing by U.S. military in Afghanistan, and particularly Afghanistan, but also in Iraq. And the uranium levels in Los Angeles drinking water doubled that year. That's astounding. Uh, it's also astounding that the Los Angeles Power and Water Company started measuring uranium levels in Los Angeles drinking water in 1998. A big question is why? Now, in a document that I got from uh, a think tank in Washington, D.C., they um, produced a table from uh, January 2004 through December 2007. It's a four-year period of airstrikes, the number of airstrikes each month in Afghanistan and in Iraq. 
and I was able to see in that chart when it was plotted on a graph that the United States military is synchronizing peak bombing periods in Iraq and Afghanistan with the summer monsoon in July and August and part of September and with the winter monsoon in January and February and part of March.